Good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody in the gallery switch off mobile phones so it doesn't interfere with the committee's work this morning? Um, first item is a decision on taking business in private. Can I get members' agreement to take items three and four in private? Thank you very much. Let me move on to the substantive item, which is item two, and we'll now take evidence on self-directed support. I welcome to the committee this morning Paul Gray, Director General, Health and Social Care of the Scottish Government, and with your second title, Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, um, Jeff Huggins, Director for Health and Social Care Integration, and Iona Colvin, Chief Social Work Advisor, both from the Scottish Government. Um, and last but not least, Paula McClay, McClay, Chief Officer for Health and Social Care, and Beth Hall, Policy Manager at COSLA. Um, I understand the Scottish Government don't want to make an opening statement this morning, um, and could I invite an opening statement from Beth Hall? Um, it, but you don't need to provide one if you don't... No, sorry, we, we didn't Fine. intend to. That's great. No opening statements from anybody. More time for questions from the committee. What joy. Can I move first to Colin Beattie? Um, this is probably addressed more to Mr Gray. Um, you're seven years into what's basically a 10-year project. Have you got a formal evaluation as to how it's going across Scotland? Well, we have Audit Scotland's report, but we also have um, work that we have done uh, based on the, um, the data that's under development. So we have a, uh, a report which um, in, in large part coincides with what Audit Scotland is saying um, and we have uh, further work in hand to evaluate what we're doing. So the answer to that is we have a report which was uh, produced relating to 2015-16, and we have a another such report will be produced next year. We've also uh, commissioned work on um, evaluation. So yes, we are evaluating. It doesn't seem to be going very well. Um, so one of the uh, aspects of this is that <coughs> the um, data we have suggests at the top line that if you look at 208,000 people who are uh, uh, engaged in this system, um, it would appear that 26% of that number are making uh, a choice. In fact, within that 208,000 um, there are about 100,000 who are receiving uh, services such as a home alarm or who are, have a support worker. Um, and if you exclude them from that 208,000, it would suggest that over 50% of people are making a choice. The other um, part of this, of course, is, and I've, I recently went to Midlothian to, to sample some of this, that um, it is sometimes regarded as not being a choice when someone elects to have uh, the services provided by the local authority, but in fact they are explicitly making that choice. So because they're not choosing one of the other options on the, on the, on the menu of four, it doesn't mean that they're not making a choice. We're also in close touch with the um, authorities responsible for delivering self-directed support and the management information we have suggests that um, the position on choice continues to improve. So that would be my response, Mr Beattie. I mean, clearly self-directed care is bound up in the larger picture of moving resources into, into primary care. If that is successful, then it follows to some extent that self-directed care as part of that will also be successful. Looking at the Auditor General's report, there seems to be significant gaps right the way across the, the board. COSLA say that in paragraph 18, page 12 of, their, uh, uh, of the papers in front of you, that bridging finance is a significant issue. £70 million pounds was put into this and spent, and you've detailed where it's spent. Now, I assume from what COSLA is saying, that wasn't enough, or they're asking for more. How are we going to move this forward? Well, I'm happy to obviously bring COSLA in. To, uh, I won't, uh, I won't uh, attempt to speak on their behalf. And um, Mr Huggins will be able to give us some, some detail on how we're moving this forward. I think the point I'm, 
a point I would want to make, Mr Beattie, having uh, given that you've referred to the um, Audit Scotland report, uh, in terms of the uh, recommendations that the, the Audit Scotland makes uh, as to what we ought to be doing, and that's the recommendations for the Scottish Government, COSLA and partners working together, I'm not uh, in any sense disputing these re uh, recommendations. There is more to be done. So I am not presenting to you a proposition that says there isn't more to be done. Whether more money will be the answer to that is a separate question, but we are, we are taking forward action in response to the recommendations, and I'm happy if you would like Mr Huggins to give you more detail on that. Yeah, certainly happy to. Um, I, I suppose two, two, two issues here. First of all, to understand where we are in the programme. And that, as you've said, this is a, we're seven years into a 10-year programme, but I think we have to understand the different stages that we've gone through. So the, the programme begins with the, the framing of the intention to legislate in this space. Um, the consultation, the engagement, the process by which we actually... If I can interrupt on one thing. <coughs> we're seven years into a 10-year programme. The end date was 10 years. Is it still 10 years? Um, the, there's been no change to the, the end date. I, I suppose I was just trying to set out what was within that 10-year programme so that we could say and talk about the progress that we've made through the programme. So the, the initial period of time was around the framing of what we would do, how we would take forward the intention to bring into place self-directed support. Within the second stage of the, the work, you then have the, the period that the Parliament itself spent in framing the legislation, uh, the legislation that was taken forward successfully with... Um, you know, with good support within the Parliament for the legislation. And we're now effectively in the third phase of implementation within that 10 years, which is to begin to pilot, roll out and embed the approach within the system. And, and the Audit Scotland report is largely on that third phase, but it's important to understand that we didn't start 10 years ago with legislation in place and the frameworks in place, that, that the 10-year programme has also encompassed the need to, to bring forward the policy proposals and the the legislation. I think it's it's important also to understand what the 70 million is for. The 70 million isn't for new services. The 70 million is for advocacy and advice. It's for support to local systems to create the mechanisms that they need to take forward. Self-directed support. Self-directed support applies to the three billion that we spend on adult social care and to other social care budgets as well. So, you know, in terms of the application of the resource, the you know the self-directed support is the mechanism by which we use the resource which is in, in the system already. And the 70 million which is allocated is basically for the transitional support, the advocacy, the advice, the support to third sector organisations to, you know, to be able to adopt the process. And that's been used across the, seven, across the 10 year period. And you know, we can say, say more about that, but the 70 million is not buying new services. The, the services is funded through the general allocations from GAE and through the resources which are in integration authorities transferred from the NHS. But if I look at the, the Care Inspectorate submission, they say that their findings are that self-directed support has not yet had the impact across the country it aims to achieve. It cites various things like lack of training, poor engagement, lack of advocacy and support for older people, overly cumbersome systems and tools. They say that the, the self-directed support is less well-developed in relation to children and young people, and this has not been an area of priority focus. What's happening? Are you really going to fix all this in the next three years? <coughs> I think you have to see this as, uh, as uh, working through a process. I think we have, we have a number of things happening in parallel here. So what we have is the, and the, you know, the Audit Scotland report and other reports reflect on this in that in parallel with introducing self-directed support, we've introduced health and social care integration. And you know, the consequence of that is that we have significant change happening across the system in parallel. I think what we can see when we look at those areas which are working better, and it's reflected in the data as well, is some areas have moved quickly to adopt new approaches around commissioning, which embed the idea of self-directed support uh, effectively. O other areas I I have sought to, I guess, continue with the historic ways in which they commission and allocate care, and have found it more difficult in that context to, to embed self-directed support. But you know, what we have is a process which is you know, a common process, which is some areas tend to make progress faster than others. It's not always the same areas. Um, and you know, the, the, the team from the Scottish Government, the team from COSLA, um, the SSSC, um, the Care Inspector and others are working with partnerships with local authorities to effectively you know, take it forward. In, in terms of the implementation phase, we're about halfway through the implementation phase. Um, and you know, what we're seeing is good progress in some areas. 
um, we're seeing uh, probably some of the things which we might have anticipated. So greater use of the option one for the under 65s with disabilities, you know, less use of option one for the over 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 65s with with frailty. And you're beginning to see it actually fall into place in, in terms of in terms of what's going on. And it, it's it's designed as a learning process. I don't think we would have known or could have understood all of the complexity going into the into the process and, and that's where we are now. Do you agree with the, the statement from COSLA in their paragraph 11? Uh, questions have arisen over the extent to which NHS boards are meaningfully transferring their unscheduled care hospital budgets to integration authorities. I'll bring Jeff in on that. Um, COSLA have raised these questions. and in, So this is to do with what's called the set-aside budget. And that that is... Um, actually a subject that we are we are discussing just now. I've, I've discussed this with chief executives twice in the past month. Um, we had a, a very helpful meeting involving uh, COSLA, chief executive board chairs and chairs of IJBs um, and chief executives of local authorities uh, a few weeks ago. And that is one of the issues that's, that, that, that we are discussing. So I accept it's an issue under discussion. Um, I think there are differences of view uh, about the extent to which the set-aside budgets um, can and should be transferred, but we are agreed with COSLA that that's something that we need to resolve. But you are still confident that the 10-year deadline is going to be met? Well, the set-aside budget is, a, is perhaps a slightly separate issue, but um, I, we are still working towards delivering what we said we would within the 10 years. We've got three years to go, and the the management information we have does suggest to me that there's progress. Will we be 100% successful in ten in, 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 within another three years? I'm not about to guarantee that, but we're certainly working towards it. I, I think maybe to, to add to that, one of the things which, we're, which we've son, seen during 2017, because the, the set-aside budget is the budget for large hospitals, effectively. That's the, the budget which is supporting the... Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, that, that's what those budgets relate to. I think what's been very interesting this year is that a number of the integration authorities are beginning now to plan across a, a range of different locations and think about how they provide services for cohorts like older people. So we see the, um, we see the Glasgow City Integration Authority looking at older people's services and, and picking up both hospital, residential care, care at home, um, housing support, but also um, palliative and end-of-life care, and also how they'll implement the carer strategy. And instead of looking at all of those separately, which is what would have happened previously, they're actually looking at it as a, as a, as a coherent whole, whole and thinking what should the shape of services be for those who are over 65 within Glasgow City. And, and that's, that's a big step forward. And in doing that, they're thinking both about the monies that have been previously spent on primary care and on social care, but also the money that actually is spent within hospital to decide what is the way in which they can deliver the best value for the community from that overall resource. And that, that's really quite innovative. It's, you know, it's very much the intention of integration to get into the space of thinking beyond the individual silos and services, but actually understanding how you can take best value from public money across the piece. And, and set aside is, is within that, in that the, the resource that relates to the large hospitals is within the control of the Glasgow City Integration Authority. Where the money actually sits is probably less, less important. But in that context, they are actually able to consider that as part of the bigger picture, rather than have that bracketed off and left as, as a sort of separate entity. Because you know, pe people go through transitions. People, um, certainly as part of the Glasgow City approach, their intention is to reduce falls, to provide better support at home to reduce unscheduled admissions, to reduce occupied bed days, to reduce delayed discharge, and they've been very effective on that over the last um, two, two years. But they, they're only able to do that by being able to look across the whole picture rather than seeing this as individual service areas. So I think when, when we read the comments in the cultural submission, I think we acknowledge the, the significance of them, but we are also seeing progress on the ground in terms of how resources being used. Um, I wonder whether COSLA might want to comment on what they've heard. I heard you, I saw you trying to indicate to get in, so is there anything you want to say at this stage? Um, <clears throat> I think maybe just to, to pick up on the points that were initially made, um, it's really important to be clear that SDS requires major disinvestment 
in services in order to be able to reinvest in, in new models of support. So transformation funding was mentioned. That incurs dual running costs. And when you take that coupled with increased public expectations and the difficulties in making some of the, the shifts in resource within integration authorities that we've we've just talked about because not everywhere is experiencing the picture that, that Jeff's just outlined, um, it perhaps becomes unsurprising that we're, we're facing difficulties um, with implementation. And I think Audit Scotland also found um, that the scale of the challenge was underestimated and we're therefore facing a longer programme of support, but without the, the resources to make those transformations. Okay, so, so basically resource and the adequacy of resource to allow you um, to make that transformation is a key issue for, for COS, and I think somebody else will, will explore that later. I wonder whether I can go back to something Mr Huggins said that left me slightly perplexed, because... Um, I don't think legislation has ever been described to me as a learning process. I mean, legislation, in my view, is a decision, then implementation. Um, you know, yet you seem to suggest that this was the case for SDS. No, I think what I was saying was that um, we've gone through, we're in the third phase, and the third phase is the implementation phase, where we're actually seeing this now apply within localities, within commissioning systems and for individuals. And that implementation phase is the, is the point at which we need to see what is going on learn from what's going on, make adjustments and move on. The, the legislation is completed and I, I guess we're here today because you're considering the, um, both the adequacy of the legislation yeah. and the adequacy of implementation of it. But you know, we, see the, we see the legislation as a completed process. We are in a learning process about how to implement the legislation. But the legislation and the rhetoric round about that promise transformational change. Yet you will have read the transcript from um, people at a round table here a few weeks ago um, that suggested that service user organisations were disappointed. Um, you know, so what do you say to them? And, and with all due respect, you know, if they were happy, then that would underline the point you made about it's not being recorded properly. They're not happy. So you cannot blame recording systems for what is a quite low, shamingly low uptake in SDS. So, so I think, I think there's, two, there's two or three things around that. First of all, as is reported in the Audit Scotland report, what we have at the moment is um, we've had data problems in terms of actually understanding what's going on, which we are addressing. And a component of how we're addressing that is through the move from the snapshot survey and additional survey work to bringing the data in respect of social care and SDS into, <coughs> into source, um, which also enables us to link the data to other data in terms of actually understanding what's going on within the system. You know, the source data is the data that we largely use um, to support integration authorities. So we're, we're addressing issues around the data. So we think that the position has been better and indeed when we see the data again next year will be better again in, in, in terms of implementation. I think the other element, though, to understand is, and again, this is reported on and noted, is the complexity of trying to do two things at the same time. And, and one of those is to offer choice and control to individuals, you know, which is a, a, you know, a, a clear objective of the legislation, while at the same time asking integration authorities to plan for populations and trying to find the, the sort of fit between planning for populations and providing choice and control to individuals is, is really quite complex. Um, and again, as I said earlier, what we see is those areas who have addressed it through how they approach commissioning have done better in that area, whereas those areas who've, um, whereas other areas have not moved so quickly into that space. But I think it is the challenge between how you actually are able to meet the needs of individuals within a system, but also to meet the needs of a whole population. And, and that's really quite a hard ask. I, I think that's probably... Surely you should have thought of that before passing the legislation and raising expectations. I think I think it, I think le legislation always um, is, is is always framed with um, a high objective in mind, and I think you know what we're seeing through and the you know, the the case studies that we've seen, um, the examples that we've seen, the work that we're seeing, and, and in some areas, you know, particularly like highland, remote, and rural areas, we're seeing um, self-directed support as being the a key mechanism by which we deliver care. Um, I, I think the fact that something is going to be difficult and hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Um, no, no, I'm not suggesting that, but you maybe should have thought about it in advance. Alex Neil. Can I, can I start with uh, COSLA, please? Because reading both your original response and the supplementary, you get the feeling that you're putting up the white flag. It's all the fault of the Scottish Government, not enough resources. It's all part of the underfunding of the local government. 
and really, you know, we're, we're in the blame culture here rather than, you know, trying to address some of the key issues. And certainly at the front line as an MSP, uh, I certainly find, you know, that the awareness, for example, amongst end users of their rights and obligations uh, very often is zilch when they come to a social work department in the first place. But I get the feeling from COSLA this is all about blame rather than how do we sort this? How do we address the issues? Why have we got so many authorities performing so poorly compared to some of the better ones? What's COSLA doing about it? So um, I think there's a difference between holding up a white flag and blaming people and stating some facts about the difficulty of the task ahead of us. We have a task for transformational change to deliver SDS. That is not an easy thing to deliver for local government. And to do it, we need adequate support and transitional funding. Um, I think our assessment of the situation is that the funding, the transformational funding, hasn't been adequate um, to meet the scale of the challenge. And that's a fact from our perspective. It's not blaming, but it is a fact. You couple that with the implementation um, of the Public Bodies Act, the initiatives that we've had, new initiatives, new legislation placed on local government, all of which require evolution and transformation of services, change, <coughs> investment, behavioural change. And there is a reality on the ground as to what the, the pressures that local authorities are facing to try and deliver for people in that environment. And we would be remiss not to identify it thoroughly in our evidence to this committee. What we are doing is not just saying it's not our fault, um, just give us some mon money and that'll fix it. We need money, but we also need to ensure that we are working with Scottish Government, and we are, on the improvement plans, on the uh, future implementation, how we leverage the system within the resources that we've got and what is realistic to expect. We know that is an improvement journey. We are working to support local authorities to step up to that and to implement the changes required, and we're working with Scottish Government on how we support that nationally. So I think it's a tale of two stories here. We will continue to work with Scottish Government and with local authorities and with the third sector to ensure that the legislation, as it was envisaged, is successfully delivered. But there is a reality on the ground of what is required and the environment that we're in that also needs to be acknowledged. Obviously, in terms of resources, uh, that's a big issue um, mm -hmm. that you've highlighted. So what's COSLA's estimate of the additional resources you need to make this happen and get it back on track? I think when you're asked to, uh, and, and I, I had this uh, experience earlier in the week um, when talking about care home sustainability, when you're asked to pluck a figure um, of what would it take for the whole of local government to deliver <coughs> one particular policy, um, and, and the transformational change that that requires, I think that's a very difficult thing to deliver on, on the day a specific estimate. What we do need to do, and what we are saying we need to do, is look at the whole pressure on social care, um, look at all the initiatives that we've got and the resources we've got to deliver them, and say, together, is that sustainable and are those expectations realistic? Um, and I think there's a piece of work there to do in the round. What you can't do, and, and what we're increasingly finding, is dealing with the social care budget um, on an individual and incremental basis is a very difficult place to be for local government and for Scottish government. So you can adequately say the carer's bill might cost X. Uh, free personal care to under 65s will cost Y. Sist uh, transformational change for um, SDS will cost another amount. We need to look at the overall budget and the pressures on it, and we need to make some choices about where we're prioritising our spend and what it will take. But surely, I mean, when the legislation went through, a financial memorandum it was attached to the legislation, mm -hmm. which gave estimated costs of implementing the legislation. Yeah. What COSLA is saying is... At the time, we said that the transformational funding had been underestimated. Right. By how much? I, I think the... 
we didn't give an amount. I think there's an so issue how do you in know here. It's underestimated. I, mean, you, you I think we know it's underestimated because that's been borne out by the fact that we've had 70 million and actually, you know, that has not but leveraged the change. We haven't been able to I'm deliver it. To the order of magnitude, I realise dealing with 32 local authorities, you can't give me a very precise figure. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you refer to the 70 million. Should that 70 million have been 80 million, 90 million, 100 million, 150 million? What's the order of magnitude? I think it needs to be significant. When you look at what local government got out of that money, what was it, 17 million in total over? Yeah. I, 17, some, I haven't done the same, it's 6 plus 11 plus 3. So. <laughs> um, but that is not even 50% of the transformational money that went in to deliver this legislation. That is not adequate to deliver the cultural and behavioural change. I'm, I'm more than happy to go away and look with Scottish Government at the additional resource that we need. I think the conversation has always been, here's the resource we've got, how do we deliver it within that? We've argued long and hard that that's not going to be enough, and it's borne out now through the Audit Scotland report. But, but there, there are two issues. One is the overall amount needed to make it work right across the board, and I understand why COSLA would find it difficult to give that, because that involves the third sector, it involves the uh -huh. Scottish Government's responsibilities and so on. Uh, but the second part of the argument is what do local authorities themselves need to uh -huh. make this work? I mean, as we've heard, we're nearly three quarters of the way through the implementation uh -huh. period, and we're, I think, way behind of where we expected to be. Uh -huh. Um, and we can spend a lot of time going over spilt milk for the last yeah. seven years, but really what's more important is how do we catch up? Uh, yeah. Because at the end of the day, this is about the end users. Um, so in order to catch up and in order to provide on a permanent basis <laughs> the level and quality of service that's envisaged in the legislation, um, how much more money for this area does local government need uh, order of magnitude? Okay. Do you? Yeah. So you can you can write back to us once yeah. you have an opportunity. I mean, I, yeah, to I, I would this. be happy yeah. to go back to local authorities and yeah. um, look at exactly how much we need. I think the other issue in this, though, in the money, is when you get transformational funding, it's been um, I don't want to say eked out, but it's been year on year, and actually right. this change is significant, I and I think we need that to be prioritised in one year to leverage the yep. change rather than incrementally delivered year yep. on year. That's not going to help us to leverage system change. I think the two or three things, one of the things you take from both presentations is there's a lot of pretty small funds instead of, you know, it doesn't seem to be a big picture. Uh -huh. um, and I, 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 I accept personally what you say about one year budgets. Can I ask both the Scottish Government and COSLA, um, the debate so far and the discussion and your submissions have been primarily about inputs, um, but what outcomes uh, do, do we want? I mean, obviously, um, uh, an outcome in a sense is um, uh, uh, the percentage of people who are actually on self-directed support as envisaged, but uh, the whole purpose of self-directed support was to improve the outcomes for the end users. So who's measuring that and what improvements have there been? Is there evidence of where self-directed support has been working and has been more effective? Has it made the material difference to the outcomes and the quality of life for the people we're trying to help? Thank you for I think the reference to, to outcomes is, is incredibly helpful and that's where we where we need to be focusing. Um, I think Paula mentioned some points about the need for us to collectively challenge the continued focus on initiative-led budgets and input-focused policy initiatives. So the Public Bodies Act set out national health and wellbeing outcomes and put them on a statutory footing. Um, these are therefore jointly owned by local government, Scottish government and yeah. indeed the parliament. Um, and I think we all have a joint <laughs> responsibility to be ensuring that the, the fiscal and the legislative policy landscape function to support the delivery of those outcomes. Yeah, like we accept all that, but what I want to know is, from local government and the Scottish government, 
what evidence have you have do you have historically since SDS was implemented the mm -hmm. SDS <coughs> is achieving where mm -hmm. it's been implemented properly uh, is it achieving the outcomes envisaged? I mean, I think I, I think I would refer you to the work that Audit Scotland have done in that respect. There's plenty of evidence in there around where areas are making real progress, where they're innovating. Um, there's positive feedback from service users. I accept there's also some more negative um, stuff in there as well. There's a range of research being done by people like Self-Directed Support Scotland. Um, I've been uh, in discussions with them where they've acknowledged that they found high levels of satisfaction with the services that people were, were uh, being provided. Um, we have the social care survey reporting that 81% of people are satisfied with the services that they're receiving. Um, I think the problem we have is when we talk about SDS implementation, we start focusing on stats around option choice and attempting to make some kind of value judgment um, on people's choice and using high levels of option three as a proxy for poor implementation. Um, that, that isn't the case. Um, choosing to continue with council arranged services is, is a valid choice. It's, it's not for... I think the problem, Beth, is that there's clear evidence that people are not being fully explained the choices, and, and, and therefore one of the reasons, I'm not saying the main or the only reason, but clearly I know from my own experience as an MSP, one of the reasons why option three is so high is because people aren't getting the other options explained to them properly. I, th I think we need to be careful around anecdotal... Um, evidence. It, it has a role. Well, it's not anecdotal. I've seen it. It's, it's evidential. I mean, I've seen it. I've, I've got a whole caseload of people okay. um, who come into that category. Okay. And so, the same is true of other... Lo I mean, I live in South Ayrshire, and the same uh, is true there of the people I speak to in the third sector there, okay. uh, for example. So, you know, I, I'm not I'm not attacking local government. I'm just saying <laughs> it's not working at the grassroots always the way it should be. Re returning... Um, to the data, and sorry, I was drawing a contrast there between um, research we have, scrutiny reports that we have that are reporting about that qualitative experience, um, which in 81% of cases is positive, um, according to the, the, the social care survey data. Um, what we have when we look at SDS implementation is we focus on the four options and use that as a proxy for um, implementation or, or compliance. And I think we just need to be really clear and careful as well some of the the percentages that have been discussed today and in other sessions um we're in year four um of implementation of the legislation and um, the data that we're looking at is for year two so it by no means represents the most recent picture um recording option choice was new for for councils that comes at a cost when you have to change your it systems um, and councils without sufficient transformation funding would have had to make a choice about where do we put that investment? Do we go for the IT systems and the finance systems or do we invest it in changing services and, and improving support to people? So I think we just need to be really careful when we're thinking about um, implementation, client uh, compliance and what evidence we have. There's, there's quite a lot of caveats around that. Um, I think COSLA and Scottish Government are aware of that and we're working together to support improvement there. Jeff mentioned the, the source work that links health and social care data. We're also working within the context of integration to improve wider social care data, including data about personal outcomes, which is quite it's quite expensive to capture that kind of information well. We tend to rely on care inspectorate reports in, uh, in the interim. We're also working to improve data that's collected about carers. There's a new data specification just being issued earlier this year. Um, we're continuing to talk with government about the costs of, of making changes to systems. But what we've seen from councils, if you look at the, the data we've been referring to today, um, is in year one of implementation, we had 10 councils, weren't able to break things down into options. That's dropped to four in year two, and as I said, we're currently in year four. We won't know what the picture is now until a year and a half from now, because of the data cycles. Okay. okay. Can I just go back to Paul, and I want to clarify two figures. First of all, the 70 million uh, transitional figure, uh, or bridging finance, um, is that purely for SDS? That doesn't include bridging finance for integration? No. 
that, that was aimed at SDS. Do you understand? Purely that? SDS. So, so, so the 70 covers some of the implementation costs for local government. It co covers the costs of providing um, advice and support locally. Uh, to individuals, so it, yeah. it's purely about the mechanics. But, it, but it's related it's to SDS. Purely about SDS. So what's the bridging funding for integration? I, I don't think we've offered bridging funding. What we have offered, and it's it's been through each of the last two spending reviews, have been additional resources into integration authorities from the NHS budget to support integrated care. And I, I think the you know the figure that up to 17-18, um, the year that we're currently in, was an additional £357 million um, was transferred from the NHS into the integration authorities um, to, support, to support integration. Right. That's in addition to the historic figure of the £100 million, which is the um, um, reshaping care for older people resource and the additional 30 that was also there for um, delayed discharge. So, you know, as you begin to sort of look through the additional resources that have gone in, over the last three, four years, they've been quite significant. But, you know, so, 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 so looking, just picking up the base point of SDS, which also applies to integration, you've got this period of transition where you're effectively funding two systems running in parallel because you've got to disinvest in the old system. You can't disinvest until people go into the new system. So that 300 odd million, is that in, <coughs> including funding for that kind of trans, you know, to, to fund that double run until you can make the transfer? I, I think I think I think it's it's maybe important to think about what the different funding streams are supporting. Well, that's in, what I'm asking. Yeah, what, I know. Does, I'm, does I'm, it support I'm, I'm, that? Does I'm, that funding stream? So, straightforward so, answer, Jeff. Does that funding stream of three hundred odd million support the, the the bridging aspect of running two services at once? In effect, because you're setting up the new service, but you, you can't get people all that quickly sometimes off the old service. So the 300 odd million for integration, does that include um, effectively bridge financing to run two services until you can switch to one? So, so the additional transfers that have gone into integration budgets are largely for the um, costs of direct service provision. So that's the cost of packages. So that's somebody who goes into your house or that's the cost of a residential care package. Okay. The, the resource that's associated, the 70, is largely about the <coughs> mechanisms by which people would actually access a package. So the, the process of assessment, um, the advice that might be offered to the individual, um, but also some of, the, um, you know, some of the work which is related to the, the process. The, the resource that's in the integration authorities, um, you know, the almost half a billion that's been allocated there, is largely for the provision of direct care. And I, th I think what, the, what you're seeing, and again, this is one of the broader questions which comes into this is, as you're seeing new approaches being developed, such as the work in the carers legislation as well, the support that's, that, that's in place for that, it, it, you know, one of the things that we would expect to see is um, a transition from old systems to new systems. Uh, and part of the challenge that we find is that quite often it's been presented as the need to continue to run the old system and have the new system. And, and I think we need to get beyond that mindset. You need, you need to actually see the, the full transition. If I can draw, I'll, Paul, I think, wants to come in. Sorry, I was wondering whether um, the committee wanted a response from us on outcomes. Yes, yes, please. I'm happy to continue on this or to go to outcomes as the committee wishes. I think can, I, the, can I just the, finish this point? Yeah, there's bridging. a line of questioning to, to, to be yeah, concluded, yes. and I think Paula McClay wanted in as yes, well. Yes, if, if I go back to the switch over from the old Victorian mental health institutions to care in the community 20, 30 years ago. One of the reasons why that was handled so successfully over a five-year period or so was that bridging finance was provided by the Scottish office to the relevant authorities for to cover this period where you had to run two systems effectively in parallel until you made the transition, because you can't make it on day one. You know, you can't empty, <coughs> you couldn't empty the hospitals in day one any more than we can empty the acute services of people who don't need to be there in day one. You, you end up having to fund the existing system until you create the facilities, uh, in this case, case in the community, to allow you to empty the hospital. So my question is, is that 300 odd million, is that including effectively the equivalent of bridging finance? 
So, so I, th I think it's important to think about what happens at the point at which somebody exercises choice in respect of SDS, because that's the, the intention. So um, previously, if we, if we take the example that an individual may have been receiving care as part of a care at home package in the context of the council having made an assessment of their needs and then provided them with a number of hours um, each, each week, if they then, um, having taken advice using the resource that's supported in respect of advice, been assessed for uh, um, SD, uh, through the SDS mechanisms and decided instead they wanted to exercise option one um, and that they themselves wanted to take on the budget and commission their own care, what would then happen is that they would then be given the budget to do that and that the care package that was being provided by the council would simply stop. So there isn't a period in which they'd both be receiving the, the, the service from the council and also receiving the SDS. But my question was about integration. About the 300, you, I mean, you, that's why I was making the distinction between the 70 million for SDS and the issue, because it's 70 million, and, and the issue was raised by COSLA on SDS about bridge funding, but there's also related here is integration. So my, for the third time, can I ask the question, is the figure you referred to, is that including effectively what is bridging finance for integration? Um, no, the resource that's been allocated to integration authorities is additional resource to meet the costs of policies such as the living wage, but also um, demographic change and to right. provide additional service. So my next question service. then is, is part of the pressure that COSLA referred to in their evidence not, uh, could, could be addressed by the need for bridging finance for integration, given that you do effectively run two systems until you make the final switch over to the new system? I, I'm not sure what the two systems are here. I'm sorry. Well, the two systems are we're trying to empty the acute hospitals. So we reckon about a third of people in acute hospitals don't need to be there. Oh. One of the main purposes of integration, you may remember, Jeff, was to get those third <coughs> out of the acute sector into the community. You can't empty the hospitals in day one. It will take a period of years to do that. But before you create the facilities in the community, you need the money. So you need the money to create the facilities before you can empty the hospitals. Is there not a need for bridging finance to do that? It's a simple question. So, uh, so I understand that, and I, and I suppose that it's, it's, it's quite an interesting analysis and an interesting question, and, and there are different views on it. Um, our experience w where we create additional services within the community is that people access those services. Uh, and so we, um, and if we do that while we continue to have hospitals, people continue to act, access hospitals. So what effectively we do is we increase the overall service provision that is available within a locality. I'm not sure exactly within that how it is that having decided to increase the amount of um, primary care and social care, which is now being taken up by the community, how that takes us to a point at which we are then able to close our hospitals, which continue to be full. So, I, so the, the, the model of bridging finance, I think, works very well, where you're able to identify a clear closure plan for a, you know, a It doesn't need to be closure. It's about, you know, the, the hospitals are under huge pressure. I mean, that's the reason why COSLA signed up to this in the first place. One of the driving forces was to get people out of hospital who don't need to be there. Um, but maybe Paul wants to answer the question. So part of the proposition that lies behind integration, and I do want to be respectful of my COSLA colleagues and let them give their own view on this, is that the demographic trends, trends in multimorbidity, trends in the ageing population, mean that the demand on hospitals continues to grow. Mm -hmm. So this is more, I would, my judgment would be that this is more about ensuring that we can meet the demographic trends by having services elsewhere that mean that people who don't need to be in hospital can be cared for <coughs> exactly. elsewhere. There is significant investment, as the committee will know, in primary care. Um, that is intended over time to build up the general practice function, and that there is a contract being considered just now by the BMA, and they'll be vot they're voting on it. All that is part of the, the, the progress we're seeking to make in shifting the balance of care. I, I understand, Mr Neil, your point clearly made about bridging funding. At the moment, the money that is being put in through the processes that Jeff has described is not being described as bridging funding. Is that, is that so, clear so, enough? So, in top, so my question was, in top of all that money that's going in, both to the additional money into primary care and the additional money, some a lot of which is going to meet the living wage, not in primary care, but in uh, social care, to meet, to meet the living wage, obviously, commitment, which is quite right. Uh, but 
so my question is, on top of all that additional money, is there still a need for bridging finance for integration? Well, I suspect Cosler would argue that there is. And I would also point out that in terms of the overall transformation that we're seeking to do, there is over 100 million assigned to transformation. Um, the budget will be published uh, later today and it will be a parliament of an opportunity to see what is being proposed for that um, in, in, in the future year. So we are, we are putting money into transformation. Um, I'm not claiming we're describing it as bridging funding, but we are putting money into transformation. Okay. Maybe we could hear from Paula McClay before we move on to our next member. Yeah, um, so in terms of budgets, all the money that is currently being put into integration is to pay for services. Um, it doesn't account for demand, um, it accounts for spend on services. So the living wage, um, provision of care at home, it, it is to stand still. So to be very clear on that, there's, there is no transformational funding in and no transformational funding has been provided for integration. Neither has there been provided um, <coughs> money to uh, shift the balance of care, or to support the shift in the balance of care. Um, I mean, the, the purpose of integration is to shift the balance of care. It is to shift the balance of resource, and we have not seen that happen. And so, you know, there is a question to answer here about how you support people to invest in community and social care and move the money and the people from acute into those preventative services. And we're very clear on that. You know, there is, there are two ways, Jess, right? There are two ways you can do that. You can manage the change with re additional resource or you can have some fairly brutal choices about shutting one end of the system in order to immediately invest in the other. Um, those are choices that we can make. At present, there is no money for managing the transitional shift. Okay. Coffee. Yeah, I wonder if I could just stick with the evaluation side for a, a wee minute or, or so. Uh, Paul, in your paper, he, he tells, of course, that we are appointing an independent evaluator to lead research work and so on and so forth. But I'm reading this. It says that we're gathering evidence to tell us how to then evaluate the impact of self-directed sport. So does that mean we're not actually evaluating the impact now? We're finding out how to evaluate as a result of this piece of work. Have so, I understood that? So <laughs> there are three parts to the research. Um, yeah. Do you want me to go over well, that? I've, you've got that. It, you've, it you've just got says that. that we're gathering evidence to allow us to evaluate the impact. That, that tells me that we're actually not evaluating the impact at the moment. We'll do that at a later stage. So could you explain that, please? So, what we're, what we, in response to the earlier points that have been made about outcomes, part of this is designing a process whereby we can work with people who use the support and the people who care for them. That is why we've uh, we've employed. We've now appointed the, 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 the company, that are, the, the organisation that are going to uh, support us on this. And we're working with um, particularly disabled people's organisations so that we can tailor the evaluation in a way that produces results that are meaningful to the service users. That's why we're doing it in the way that we're doing it. So when will, that, when will we know this? I mean, we're, we're seven years into the programme, aren't we? I know you can't evaluate the minute we just set up the, yeah. the scheme, but seven years, eight, possibly eight years, yeah. and we we'll might get an idea of the, the impact, positive or otherwise. Well, I'd, I'd like to bring um, Iona Colvin in on, on sure, yeah. the positive impacts point, but if in, in specific answer to your point, um, just so that the com I think the committee may already be aware, but we're going to have progress reports in February, April and June 2018 and a final report by August. So, I mean, this is not something that's going to happen far away in the future. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that local authorities already evaluate for themselves the impact of what they're doing. And um, I know that we've been reminded that anecdote is not evidence, but nevertheless, I do myself take time to go and meet people who benefit from the service. I also uh, accept the points that the convener made earlier that some uh, individuals and organisations remain disappointed with the uptake at, and, and the provision of self-directed support. But perhaps Iona could say something about impact and outcomes. Sure. 
I don't want to go back over the issue about the options, but I suppose in, in a, I've been in this role now for the last nine months, and part of that nine months has been going around the country and talking to colleagues about what's happening across the country. And it is a very, a very mixed picture, but I know that a lot of uh, authorities do feel uh, that we shouldn't judge them just by the, the issues around the options and the numbers of options and the numbers that choose option one or option two. Um, and I think the key to that is how well some authorities have embedded this within their assessment. So their assessment isn't an assessment there and then a self-directed assessment over there. It's all one. And it's one process, Midlothian, uh, Highland, and uh, in fact, North Lanarkshire particularly have been really, uh, and East, East Ayrshire is the other one, have been really pretty successful at that. And I think that's part of the key to it is um, that we don't have two assessment processes. We have one assessment process in which looks at uh, people's individual needs, but also looks at the outcomes that they would like to see. And it is about working with people, which is something that social workers are uh, very much uh, trained in and used to doing. I think it's been difficult to gather that evidence because it is based not just on how many people take the different options, but based on individual experiences of care and whether or not um, their outcomes have been differently articulated and whether or not they feel that they, they have met those outcomes. Um, and so there's a lot of individual evidence. A lot of all the authorities are looking at that within their own authorities. So they will have an assessment. And I think the job that we're trying to do is how do you pull that together in a meaningful way that reflects that people are having better outcomes because there's more focus on talking to people about what outcomes are looking for and more focus on achieving those outcomes. Um, so, I've, and I was recently uh, talking at a conference in North Lanarkshire, in fact, in Airdrie, and uh, around being human was the, the title of the conference, a very interesting conference, a very interesting title. And uh, I've seen and spoken to many people uh, in North Lanarkshire around their experience of uh, self-directed support and could see very clearly the difference between a traditional care package where you would have somebody coming into your house four, four times a day and somebody uh, has an, an individual carer and where they direct when they have the contact and that uh, and particularly uh, there were a number of service users of people who have lived experience basically talking at the conference about the difference that that has made to their lives and it's a fundamental difference in terms of uh, the quality of their life and the outcome so it's it's I think what we're trying to work on is how do we capture that and feed that in as well as how do we assure you that in fact we are having a consistent <coughs> approach across the country and I, I absolutely acknowledge the point uh, uh, made earlier about that people need to be offered this as part of an option and that, that sometimes that's not happening. And that's the bit where I think we really need to focus together on, and we're working together with COSLA in, in terms of looking at how do we improve the current situation in terms of that understanding of, of the process and making sure that people are aware of it and that it's discussed uh, absolutely appropriately with them and how do we gather the evidence to show you that in actual fact uh, people have a different experience of care and there are a number of there are lots of things going on across the country um, and and that's kind of <laughs> a general experience and there are lots of really good things going on ac across the country the, pro the issue is how we get to a point where it's consistent and we will learn from each other together collaboratively and actually improve uh, improve the processes and the practice and of course the outcomes for people and that's part of the discussion that's going on um, just now and Paul and I have, uh, have also been working on a uh, work around the workforce as well which we'll begin to look at what are the skills we require what what does the future workforce look like in this respect and how do we make sure that we have a workforce that's fit for the future yeah, that, yeah thanks for that you know I was going to ask our COSLA colleagues about that and you mentioned East Ayrshire we, we've taken some evidence from East Ayrshire and I'm, it's my authority so I know what they're doing down there and I'm pretty impressed with what, what they're doing but what's the picture across the local authority landscape to, to Paula and Beth because one of the, these issues was raised by Audit Scotland and their work about what's being done locally what is the picture across Scotland in terms of data gathering to tell us what the impact of this is and how does that work feed into this independent review that Paul's carrying out presumably it'll join up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think I highlighted some of the things that we know are going on with data at the local level when I, I spoke earlier um, about councils improving their systems and increasingly being able to record whether someone has chosen option one, two, three, or indeed four. Um, I think where we want to make further improvements are around the impact that that choice is having in terms of whether personal outcomes are achieved. Um, and that's the area that's more difficult for, for a number of different reasons. It's an output, it's very qualitative. It's an output of a conversation um, between uh, a service user and the, their care manager. And in terms of how you actually measure whether an outcome has been achieved or not, what we absolutely want to avoid is some kind of tick box approach that, that doesn't really capture what's going on. So for example, if, um, if I was a, a young person with, with learning disabilities and one of my personal outcomes was to improve my social circle, um, how do we actually measure that? How do we capture it? How do I as a council commission an IT provider to make my data capture system be, be capable of doing that? Um, and over what time period would it be reasonable to expect that personal outcome to have been met? Um, and how would we ensure that those very nuanced things were being dealt with in the same way in every single area so that we can then sit at the national level with comparable data? So I think while we've all got this, this ambition around, around personal outcomes, there's a lot sitting underneath that. Um, and that's not to say we're shying away for it, from it or saying this is too difficult. It's just around the scale and the length of time that would take. So, I, mean, I think. Do, do, I mean, are all the health and social care partnerships doing the same thing here, basically, in, in how they evaluate? Are they are doing 32 different things? No, we have um, work that we do jointly with Scottish Government in the integration space, which is looking at having a core set of consistent data um, that can tell us about what's going on in the system, if, if you like. Um, a recent focus there has been around social care data. We, we've, we feel that there's a gap there, um, and that's something that we're working together um, to address. I think, sorry, returning to, to SDS for a, again for a moment, um, I think we, we need to ask, we need to challenge ourselves and ask a more complicated question than what's the data on SDS implementation? Are we halfway there or are we three quarters of the way there? I think SDS is an approach to delivering social care, as Iona um, uh, stated. Um, it's not a separate thing. So for me, this is about the whole system and what we know about the whole system and the way that we need to approach that is to challenge ourselves to look at inspection evidence around whether personal outcomes are being achieved, scrutiny reports like Audit Scotland's, um, the integration data that I just mentioned, um, social care survey data um, that, that we also have, and things, developments such as the new national care standards which are much more person-centred and, and outcome-focused. So I think it's really about how we look across that, that whole system. Um, and that, that gives us a, a plenty of work to be getting on with. There are two points I'd add to that in terms of outcomes, and that's the extent to which, the first one is the extent to which um, <clears throat> implementation of SDS and the outcomes that is, can achieve is being merged with an overall dissatisfaction of how much resource there is to actually meet people's needs in the system because we've raised expectations and we've done it in a period of austerity. So it's to what extent those things on the ground are being felt by individuals and transferred onto whether or not SDS is being successful for them. The other thing I would say just in the round, we're not as good as we would want to be as a country at measuring outputs, uh, outcomes, we are still measuring inputs. We've had a review of uh, targets and indicators across health and social care that did indicate we are still measuring inputs and we're measuring them without any counterbalance in that measurement and performance system, which balances whether they're achieving things for people and how we articulate that. So there is an issue in there that we collectively recognise and want to um, address, but it isn't easy. If, yeah. uh, and maybe also make the connection to um, what Paula said in respect to Sahari Burns' review, because I think it is it is very interesting. Um, we were 
Mr Neil earlier on asked about the issue in respect of outcomes. Are outcomes getting better? And it, it's difficult to say whether outcomes are getting better because historically we didn't track outcomes. So if we're looking to make a comparative between what's going on in 2017 and 2010, the data for 2010 that we'd want to compare is, isn't there. Um, we, we haven't looked at it in that way. We are, we are also asking different sorts of questions, and the questions that we're asking now are ones that we wouldn't have asked in, in 2010. So SDS, one of the key components of, of SDS is around um, personal control, the idea that I would have the ability to determine how my care would be delivered, and from that I would take a personal benefit from that sense of control in my life. I wouldn't feel that I was subject to um, arbit some arbitrary or external system making decisions about how I live my life. And, and how you actually measure control and people's sense of control, which, which is a key component of their well-being, of their um, quality of life, is, is a whole new idea, not just within Scotland, but more generally. So, you know, at the moment, we're doing work within Dumfries and Galloway around the implementation of the Dementia Outcomes work, the work that we've done with Michael Porter's International Consortium on Health Outcome Measures. And, you know, that does take you into questions around sense of safety sense of control and actually beginning to use that within local health and care systems to actually understand how those systems can understand whether they're producing benefit. And it's actually remarkably hard work. It's, it's very easy for us to know how many people went through a hospital door. It's a lot more difficult to know, you know how their experience was going through that hospital door, maybe um, not just at the point at which they might press a button which says, was your experience good today, but also how they maybe think about it two days later or how it's actually affected the, you know, the rest of their week. And so the, these, these are really quite big issues because ultimately they're about how we you know, feel about ourselves and how we live our lives. So building new systems in this space to actually be able to track whether these you know, more human outcomes rather than clinical outcomes are achieved is a whole new, it's, it's a whole new challenge. I, th I think it's one of the really exciting parts of Sir Harry Burns' review in that it basically maps out that that is the direction that we need to go in that alongside activity data and some of the population data, you also now need to be able to understand people's experience of care, um, but also the degree to which it supports them in things such as, you know, as I've said, sense of safety, sense of control, sense of well-being, you know, things that historically health, health systems wouldn't have seen themselves as being about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's when, so when you ask about why is it taking so long to develop an evaluation, Strategy. You know, part of the challenge around that is, you know, while we can look at different tools that people use to say, have you achieved your personal outcomes, simply aggregating that up and saying 74% of people achieved their personal outcomes doesn't really tell us whether this process has given generally people exercising option one or option two or option three a greater sense of control over their health and well-being. You know, and, and so there's some really quite deep questions that you need to answer. Need to answer. As Paula reflects, it also is happening in the context of a range of other changes happening within the system uh, and also changes happening to you know to people's lives more generally in terms of expectations and experience you know issues around socialization socialization social isolation but also the change in demographics in society so you're not just tracking a single thing moving through time you're tracking that while other things are changing and that that takes you into some very complex evaluation as to how you attribute you know benefit or disbenefit to any particular intervention within that space. And so that's why you, know, you need to move away from simple, you know, it used to be 74%, now it's 76%. There's just so much more going on here. Uh, just my last point, convener, that, that leads just to a final point that Audit Scotland made. It's about that kind of joined up nature, Jeff. How, how do we try and make sure that we've got an, a picture of, of what the whole service looks like, particularly way, where SDS fits within the whole health and social care integration side. Because I was chatting to some Ayrshire GPs last week in relation to the new GP contract, and they were bemoaning the fact that you've got multiple integrated joint boards, even within the single health board, like Ayrshire and you've got three there. So there's there's multiple joint boards all over the place within health boards, and they were finding it difficult difficult. To, to deal with that kind of situation. So how on, earth, how on earth do we ensure or try to to make sure that this whole system joins up and fits as correctly and appropriately as we want it to? It, it, it's a really interesting question because I guess um, general practice is a really good example of a very local service. Uh, and, you know, and as you begin to build and think about the new contract and the, the wider um, primary care team, uh, connection to social care, we're beginning to see better connections to social care. 
also looking at the issues around palliative and end of life you know as you're making the connections across the piece those happens within very local systems of care you know they're in the framework of a national contract but you know you are actually and, and we see this and when we look at the data in respect of activity um, and, and how people actually engage with services you are actually looking at, at really quite um, quite localized systems of care where people's experiences related to maybe two or three particular services G you know GPS will um, tap into voluntary or um, or other statutory services based based on proximity as well and that means again in terms of actually understanding local care systems a lot of the work that we've been doing around data through the list officers and through source you know tracking how people actually move through the system becomes really quite significant you know we, we can now um, using using the data within source understand you know the different pathways of people that people go through the system to actually understand what that means for service configuration and some of the work we've done has been in Ayrshire so we've looked at um, you know the, the path by which people um, um, over 65s who are um, high users of service how they go through the system and that's given us a lot of knowledge about basically the two tracks that they follow one which is a frailty and fall track and one which is a dementia and um, psychogeriatric track and, and but until we actually had that data which enabled us to understand how they were going through the system it just looked like a lot of episodic care uh, and you know, and again this is part of the challenge for the the clinician within the system is that they see the person in front of them but they may not recognize that across this area of Ayrshire you know East Ayrshire or North Ayrshire there's been 20 people like that this month you know, all going through and that enables you then to think differently about how you approach that as a cohort in terms of the connection to hospital services to specialist services but also the support you offer to primary care I, I, I think the you know the the, the you know the, the size of integration authorities varies quite considerably across the country you know, from 22,000 in Orkney to um, somewhere around half a million in, in Glasgow City um, but within that you then have the hundred odd localities which is where a lot of this very local planning needs to take place um, because most people's experience of healthcare services is, is local mm. it's very helpful thank you okay Liam Kerr thank you Beth Hall do you want to say something there you looked as though you want to come in yeah if, if I could thank you um, it's just to pick up on some of the points Jeff was making there and I think we need we need to be really clear that integration is is about more than just IGBs there are services sitting out with the IGBs in in local government and in community <coughs> planning um, that can act to support the, the success of integration um, or not so I'm thinking community justice and children's services aren't always integrated housing has a, a huge play a huge role to play and if you look at the other local government services such as um, leisure environment they have a massive contribution to make towards the prevention agenda and um, so I think we tend when we're talking about shifting the balance of care um, and early intervention and prevention we can very too easily take quite a narrow focus it's not just about shifting from acute to community health and social care it's also about a shift further upstream to preventative services which which are kind of sitting um, with local government and th the reason I mention this is it's relevant to to SDS Jeff talked about control and empowerment and I think we need to remember that at its core SDS is is more about more than services to meet needs it's about moving away from that deficit model. So it's not about needs and services to, to meet them. It's about assets and outcomes and how we achieve them. So that, that means we're into the space that's around building individual and community assets. Um, a good SDS conversation is about the outcomes you want to achieve and all the resources that might be available to help meet them. And that includes individual strengths. It includes carers, family, the wider community um, and I think we won't be genuinely successful in, in delivering the original vision of, of SDS unless we can move into that space um, and you can imagine what I'm going to say next which is around concerns about all that councils do to tackle inequalities to build stronger communities is becoming harder and harder because while we're seeing some money going into health and social care which allows us to stand still as as paula highlighted we're seeing a corresponding <coughs> reduction in the wider local government stuff and I, I i just worry that we have very narrow conversations about the shifts that are required and if we're thinking about sustainability over the longer term i i, I worry that's a real mistake 
Can I, I'm going to actually come back to that exact point. Very briefly, Paul Gray, uh, Willie Coffey was asking some questions around data capture. And uh, the, we heard from Inclusion Scotland uh, in a previous session that different local authorities capture data in different ways. Um, and, and now it's coming together and we're trying to sort it out. Why was that not done at the start? Why did no one plan properly? Well, <clears throat> If we wait, it, first of all, uh, Mr. Kerr, if, if 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 we wait until everything is perfect, we will not do anything at all. Um, but a more um, perhaps constructive answer. Is that an to your acceptance question. that there was a failure to plan, Mr. Gray? No, I think we started with what we had, and that uh, that is a key tenet of improvement. You have to start with what you have. If you that that's that runs. Um, through our improvement science approach, you, you, you have to start with what you have, otherwise you, you never start anything. I am not saying there was a failure to plan. What I am saying is that we have, we have based on experience and learning, built the systems and made them better. We have improved the data collection, it improved to give us a, a set of data on 2015 and 16, which we were able um, to put out as data in development. We've developed it further and we're continuing to develop it. Um, also, I think these are, as COSLA colleagues have said, these are choices that local authorities still have to be allowed to make about where they make investment. But they incur costs. So we talked about the IT system, and this is where I do want to come back to what we're talking about. That, that has a cost attached. If, if, if as the system develops, the, the, the local authority says, hang on, we need a whole new IT system. That has a cost attached. So that takes us back to the point that Alex Neil was making. I'd, I'd like to ask Paul McClay. Um, you, were, you were asked by Alex Neil about the financial memorandum and, and, and how much more money is needed to make things work. Uh, but you, you were fairly clear that 70 million was not enough. And Alex Neil pressed you and said, well, how much would be enough? Uh, and you didn't seem able to answer that. So being fair to the Scottish Government, uh, at some point, they're going to say, we think you need 70 million. You say, we need more. The logical question is, well, how much? And you don't seem to be able to answer that. Is that correct? I, I, OK, so 70 million was done incrementally year on year, so we never um, looked at IT systems, if we want to refresh them, how much is the cost and went out and asked that. So that's something we could do why, and we can go and ask that. Who but, didn't look at that? Um, as part of the financial memorandum, I don't think we looked at it. But when you say we, that's COSLA or who was the onus on to make that judgment? I think everybody. I don't. I, you know, it's it's on the parliament, it's on uh, Scottish government, and it's on uh, ourselves. So we would accept we didn't at the outset look at totally refreshing our IT systems and what it would cost. Um, what we do have in terms of data, and I didn't want to go into this because again, I, I I think if you pick off one element of it, you miss the fact that the funding in the round is 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 really challenging in terms of social care. But Audit Scotland's recent report on social care said in order to stand still, if we're standing still, you need um, 16 to 21% more in social care budgets by 2020. Um, so that does give a ballpark figure for what you would require. What we haven't done is broken that down and had a system-wide look at whether historic statutory pressures have kept pace the spending on that has kept pace with demand, whether the individual additional um, policy requirements and pressures put on us are sufficient, and whether the overall prioritisation we give across a shrinking budget is able to deliver on expectations. And we haven't done that, and we do need to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd accept that. We need to do it, and we need to be able to put more uh, robust figures on it. But Audit Scotland has had a look at what it would take to stand still. Um, and, and obviously, we want to evolve. We want new models of care. We are looking integration. Part of the purpose is to be more sustainable, not just to keep growing our services more and more to meet the demand as it is. But the, bearing all of that in mind, they put a figure of 16 to 21% okay. by 2020. 
I think that's useful. I mean, personally, I have a degree of sympathy and, you know, what may happen later today may be more challenging. Uh, so I think, it, but it is a fair point that the Scottish Government would say, well, how much do you need to make this work? And to my mind, they need to be presented with a figure. But then that begs the question, Paul Gray, do you accept that there is not enough money going in uh, at this stage? Do you accept the financial memorandum was wrong? And if so, who got it wrong? No, the financial memorandum is necessarily um, an estimate made at the time. Um, I am never resistant to the argument that more money would help, but then that would be true of almost anything in the world. So I think I would um, certainly welcome any uh, more detailed um, proposition from COSLA about what they think would help and in you know, at what rate in, 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 in to what specification. However, um, I mean, I think, I think, you know, we have put 70 million into this and I am not going to sit and read out my submission to you, but I do invite the committee to look at the submission which sets out where that money has gone, how it has been distributed and what it has produced. Um, and if part of this learning is to suggest that we need to make some choices, because Th that that's the issue, and Paula has fairly stated it. This is about choices. If we choose to put something further into self-directed support, we will be choosing not to spend it on something else. Mm -hmm. We'd have to decide that that was more of a priority. So what, because you've made clear, the panel has been fairly clear, that, uh, what I'm hearing from COSLA is we don't have enough resource here. Uh, in, I'm generalising, obviously, uh, but we don't have enough resource. Paul Gray, you were very clear earlier on, uh, I think you said uh, you doubt whether more money is the solution. I'm paraphrasing slightly. So, yeah. and, uh, but you were, and, and as you've just done, there may be other things that need to happen. Yeah. So who is right uh, and what is the solution? Well, part of the solution. So, so, sorry? And what will happen? I mean, you know. So part of this, well... There are many components to this solution, but let me try to keep it relatively short and simple. The work that um, COSLA, uh, that um, so IONA, our Chief Social Work Advisor, that our workforce colleagues are doing on workforce is part of the solution. Education is part of the solution. Um, again, I'm not going to read, read it out to you, Mr Kerr, but Support in the Right Direction Annual Report tells us how many people were supported. It, uh, the Innovation Fund tells us about people who had improved knowledge and awareness of approaches and so on and so forth. These investments in um, helping people to understand the system and what it can do are important. Investments in workforce are important. And these are the things that the, the, the data we gather from our evaluation will help us also to decide what to do next. What we, what we are clear about um, from the report and from um, the evidence we've gathered and from the visits we've done is that there are still people who are not clear enough about the choices that are available to them and the basis on which they might make them. That's partly about helping the workforce to explain the choices, but ha partly about making the choices more clear. Um, Though, so that sounds like a resource issue. That sounds like some cash will need to be injected into the system to, to deliver the various things that you've just talked about. And if that's so, is the Scottish Government making an assessment of what needs to be done and how much that's going to cost, and therefore how much more needs to go into the system? So um, it's largely, as I, I think I've been trying to, to, to say, it out, it's largely an, an issue of explaining and educating, mm -hmm. but we're also, as I've said in response, I think, to Mr Coffey, carrying out an evaluation and we will we will reflect on what that evaluation tells us but i'd like to have it before i decided what to do about it right i suppose the point i've been making is that if there isn't more money then we need to make some choices and those are political choices but at present we've got legislative pressures and i'll just list them for accuracy 
You've got SDS, we've got legislative pressures on children and young people, the Public Bodies Act, carers legislation, community justice, community empowerment act, we've got early years expansion, we've got the Scottish living wage, we've got additional mental uh, commitments to 800 additional mental health workers, we've got nursing and social care staffing um, pressures coming our way, we've got free personal care for under 65s, and we've got the extension implementation of the living wage to sleepovers. At some point, we have to make some choices about what we're prioritising in this system and what we're deprioritising. What we can't continue to do is keep adding more on with shrinking budgets and expecting the ends to meet. What that means is reduced eligibility, reduced numbers of people getting services and reduced eventually uh, a consequence of that is reduced quality of care. We want to work against that, we want to deliver improved outcomes, we want to be in partnership to deliver integration, the shift in the balance of care um, and health and wellbeing outcomes. But there is a stark reality about continuing to load a system with new and more commitments when the overall resource is shrinking. Which is a persuasive argument. Paul Gray, do, how do you answer that? I answer that by saying I'll await <coughs> Cosler's proposition. Go. Okay, I wonder whether I could ask something be before I bring in Monica Lennon. Um, in your paper submission to the committee on page three, you talk about distributing 40% of the funding over 2010-2018 of 26 million, but the 70 million actually started when? Was that in line with the legislation? So that would be 2013. So are you cu counting funding against that total that arose much earlier? Yes, I'd, I'd, uh, convener, I'd want to give you precise uh, answer, but I'll, I'll give you that in writing. Okay, I'm happy for you to write yeah. back to me. Um, it, whilst you're writing back to me, if you could uh, break the 70 million down, because what I heard from, from Paula McClay, and I may be wrong, um, was you seem to think you got money from the 70 million in tranches of 3, 11 and 6. Yeah, it was 11 million the year before implementation, 6 million in year one. 3.52 million thereafter, and now we've got resource that covers one staff, staff member and a development budget of a few thousand pounds, depending on the size of the authority. Okay. Well, what I'm keen to do, because just adding that up didn't get me to the figure that was in this paper, but that just might be my maths. And you know, you're saying you've distributed 35.5 million to local government. So just you know, a clarity round about the distribution of the 70 million and over what years and to where would be very helpful, and I'm happy to have it in writing. Monica Lennon. Good morning. Um, can I start with Jeff Huggins? Earlier on, in uh, response to a question, you mentioned uh, rural areas, and I can't recall exactly <laughs> what you said. Can you just remind the committee? Yeah, so, so one of the things which we've seen is in some areas where it's been quite difficult to provide social care because of workforce issues and workforce challenges, what we've seen is quite creative and innovative uses of self-directed support as mechanisms to actually enable people to secure care. So one of the examples that we would see of that would be um, Beleskin care in the in the Highlands, where in an area where the the um, where the health board, who's the provider of social care in the area, was finding it difficult to actually recruit, they uh, were able to work with the people who required care in the spit in that area, and they were then able to actually access and buy care from others who actually lived within the community. So it actually enabled them to both bring the the component of control, but also you know address a question of supply. So it's 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 one of the issues which. Um, in those areas where it's been quite challenging to provide care in traditional ways has been a mechanism which has enabled people to secure care which otherwise would have been difficult to deliver. So we're seeing aspects of that. It also, I guess, shows the degree of customisation which you can allow um, and also the degree to which it reflects you know, people's lifestyles and work patterns within localities. So you, know, you, you get to a situation where somebody who may also be the postman is doing you know, four hours of care a week. Um, as part of a, you know, a portfolio career within the locality that, that, where they work. And I, I guess it's just that, you know, that enables people to maintain their lives within the communities where they want to live, rather than actually have to move elsewhere to receive care. And that's, we think that's really valuable and really, really important. Um, we think it's the, sort of, it's the sort of creativity that we want to see generally. Um, and, and, you know, we're beginning to see more generally, but it's there, you know, come about because of a series of very particular pressures. 
it's good to hear about innovative approaches, but um, I, mean, I don't represent a, a rural area, it's predominantly uh, urban, but Jess Wade was here a couple of weeks ago from Self Direct Support Scotland, <coughs> and she did talk about rural areas, and she did talk about some of those challenges that you've acknowledged, but from what she was telling us about what her members have reported back, it, it didn't sound like a great picture on the ground. Um, she said that a lot of, because in a lot of rural areas there are no service providers are very few that people are being directed to option one when it might not be appropriate or they don't want that. So is that something that, that you recognise and, and what is what has been done about that? So so I think it, it, it genuinely is is a challenge that the all the facilities that we want aren't available everywhere. And, and in that context, trying to find creative solutions is certainly part of the way forward. You know, the, there is the challenge, uh, you know, and, and, and we see it across the country, um, pr perhaps more in rural areas than others, that a supply of a workforce which is available to offer um, care, including personal care, is not always available. You know, our objective is to be able to support um, councils and integration authorities to secure that, but ultimately we can't compel people to work as social care, care workers, and that, you know, there is a genuine challenge there. Um, you know, the examples that we've seen are quite creative. We use our facilities, our engagement with integration authorities to share those examples, you know, to talk about them with, you know, people in Argyll and Butte or people in Dumfries and Galloway, you know, so that they're aware of what's, what, what's happening. But uh, other areas, you know, there are equally challenges, you know, particularly in areas where are rural, but also which have got high employment, like Orkney, where it is just difficult to secure, se se secure people to work in the area. So, so we, so I, I can acknowledge that there is the genuine challenge there, but you know, again, we are looking to to work with providers and with um, commissioners to find ways through that. Okay, I'll probably come back to best practice, but sticking with self-directed support, Scotland evidence. Um, Jess, we'd also said that there's a a disconnect around the implementation between um, central government and local government. So she's saying to us that. She believes the legislation is sound, but she questions to what extent it is being followed. Is that a frustration that the Scottish Government shares? So, so I think it, in my earlier response, I think what, one of the things which I talked about was the, the challenge that we have of both providing individuated support um, based on choice and control alongside commissioning for populations. And, and I, I think you know that's a genuine issue. That's not a makey up issue. That, 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 there's, a, there's a genuine issue about if I if I'm to think about what the care needs are for the people of East Ayrshire, I, I need to be thinking about what the overall workforce needs are, what the um, pattern of care might be, what the residential care needs, you know, how we're offering, you know, what the uh, facilities might be around um, end of life and, and palliative. If I'm then also trying to answer the question, what I do for particular individuals and in, in, to support them to exercise their control within that. That's, that's quite a complicated picture. So I don't think um, we're seeing a disinclination to take the work forward. I think we're just really seeing the genuine challenge of trying to do both of those things at the same time. And, and you know, it's, it, it is a real challenge. You know, effectively, you're both thinking at the, you know, the whole population level, but also at the individual level. Now, there's really good reasons to do that. You know, increasingly, the work that we do under integration and the, the data work tells us about the interaction between um, a relatively small group of individuals, around 100,000 100, people within Scotland, and their interaction with the whole health and care system. You know, that 100,000 people using a r roughly half of all the resources that are used in health and care. So it makes it, you know, actually offering them choice and control to support them to live independently and safely is really valuable at a system level. But again, that's a, a, a difficult balance to bring in when there's expectations of standardisation and uniformity. And you know, many of the questions that you know, we get asked are, why can't we say everything's the same everywhere? Or why can't we guarantee that things are happening in the same way? But one of the expectations around SDS is it'll happen in very different ways to reflect what people request. And I guess that's that's an ongoing challenge. You know. Well, we've heard a lot today about, about challenges. Um, sticking with SDS, you know, their perspective is that they think it's really difficult for the Scottish Government to give strong direction to, to local authorities on what needs to change and what needs to improve. And uh, Paul Gray has talked about issues around explaining and, and educating. Um, is there a leadership problem? Um, I mean, are you, is, this, is the government fit to, to address this challenge? So, maybe, so one of the, you know, the key focal point, I think, for leadership around 
self-directed support within local systems is integration authorities. Integration authorities in their commissioning role in, in terms of setting the framework. Um, my, my team and I meet with each of the integration authorities at least once a year. Some we meet more than more frequently. We meet with the um, chief officers regularly. Uh, and you know, as part of that process, particularly around some particular challenges in respect of social care delivery, um, delay, preventing admissions, one of the areas that we are identifying with chief officers in both the local meetings and the national meetings is the opportunities that self-directed support offers within that. So we are, you know, we are very much um, working with key leaders. Can I in ask, this. at those meetings being given that the evidence shows that provision is really patchy, do you ask those chief officers why good referral pathways aren't consistent? Yeah, we do. We, we address the issues that come out of the data, um, but also where... Um, and what do they say in response? They um, identify the degree to which they're doing work in those spaces to make improvement. And it's an, this is an improvement story. This is a story where you start from where you are and you make improvement to deliver better quality outcomes. But um, So if there were like sort of top three reasons given as to why um, provision is patchy and why good referral pathways are not always in place, what would those top three answers be? So, so, so generally what, what, what comes out of the conversations is how they have prioritised the different parts of their activity over the recent years. So they will have been doing different things that, you know, as uh, Paula McClay has identified, there are a range of expectations in terms of improvement that are in place. And what we've seen within systems is um, those systems addressing those um, different improvement expectations in different orders. Um, what, what we what we do tend to do is to identify why it would be that around both and carers is another good example. You know, providing better support to carers at, at an early stage will it, it help them achieve their overarching, you know, broader strategic outcome objectives in terms of sustainability and quality, okay, and, and we making can the connections. Pause for a second, because Paul McClee ran through a, a long list of, you know, legislative requirements, statutory duties. Um, and she talked about, you know, there may be a need to deprioritise. Is the Scottish Government given any direction to local authorities that there are some areas of delivery that, that can be given lower priority? I think I think it, it comes back to what's going on within local systems in terms of the different degree of maturity that they have in those areas. So in, in some areas, the work that we did around implementing living wage was significantly more straightforward because of existing work that had, had happened. So it becomes less of a burden for that work to be taken forward. Some areas have got significantly more developed engagement with um, carers and better supports for carers within their areas. I think what, what you find is that as you work across the country, not everyone is doing everything really well. Nobody is doing everything really badly. And, and the work is about how you're looking to see how these things these things fit together. I think, I think the other element, and it's important to, to think about it in this way, is not all of these are intended to produce additional resourcing burdens, and that the intention to provide good quality support to, to, to carers is to enable carers to feel more safe and secure to provide the care that they want to offer to their loved ones for a longer period of time. And, and that has benefits both to the carer and to the individual, but also to wider sustainability. Okay. Can I ask, because I know we're probably running out of, of time this morning, you've clearly got in mind examples of innovation and, and good practice. You know, we know that good practice exists. Why is there no urgency between Scottish Government and local authorities to do more to shine a light on that good practice and to ask other people to kind of pull up their socks and, and get on with it? If you know that good practice exists, why is that not becoming the standard everywhere? But because I think, and again, it comes back to the, the situational nature. So we identify a, um, you know, the example which I gave of Beleskin Care is a great example within the, that area. At the same time, I wouldn't expect to see that same service delivered in the centre of Edinburgh. Um, I would expect to see something which is appropriate to the locality. And I guess that's the improvement challenge in that you're looking to use the facility and the framework that's there under the carers legislation or under SDS or you know, in, in different areas, different improvement areas, mm -hmm. but it needs to be very much localised. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge that you get that others have done innovative things doesn't mean that you simply drag and drop what they've done to your locality. You know, people are expecting, and also individuals are expecting individuated care. So the fact that the people in the Beleskin example I find that to be very valuable doesn't mean that people in another area of the country will equally find that valuable. And, and I guess that suggests the degree to which the change process itself is not simple and straightforward. Yeah, but do you understand why it's quite frustrating for people who don't work in the system, who are not in this uh, political bubble, that, you know, quite often best practice appears in a report and it's an example to look at, but that doesn't seem to be ruled out? Why is there no urgency? 
I think there is a very clear urgency around implementing SDS. The Scottish Government's um, um, commitment to developing the innovation, to continuing the, the, f the funding to support the change, the work that we're doing with chief officers, the work that's going on through SSSC, the work that's going on through NES, you know, the work that's going on through the care inspectorate. So, you know, both through directly through ourselves, through COSLA, but also through the national agencies, there is a very clear commitment to promote and take forward SDS. I think a key component of that will be the improvement of the data. Uh, but also the data that begins to demonstrate and, and show the degree to which outcomes are being improved. You know, but I, you know, I think this is a, a significant, and you know, as Audit Scotland reflect, you know, a, major, a major challenge to implement, and we, you know, we are working through that. Okay. Um, if I can just bring it back to the experience of, of service users. We've heard in evidence that um, reducing levels of service in, in some authorities is causing anxiety for some service users. Um, about how, how their support will, will be reviewed. Can I ask COSLA and the Scottish Government what impact diminishing resources within councils and integrated authorities is having on the flexibility and choice that's available to people? Yeah. Um, okay, just to, to focus on for a moment there, you talked about um, service users seeing services dimin diminishing. And we spoke earlier about some of the difficulties in disinvesting and reinvesting in, in new models of support. Um, I certainly picked that up from the Audit Scotland uh, report. What I also noticed was almost a dichotomy and, and a tension in terms of feedback from service users. So on the one hand, you had people who were quite anxious about that move away from traditional services and um, who want to see things like day centres retained, um, who are nervous of self-directed support because they perceive it as being about a reduction in service um, and they're aware that it's been implemented at a time where local government resources have, have, have been greatly reduced. Then, on the other hand, you hear from individuals who feel they haven't had the level of choice and control and um, innovation that they would expect from, from SDS. So you've got those two competing views and, and competing experiences. Um, and I think what councils will be struggling with, and it's picking up on some of the themes mentioned earlier that, that Iona mentioned, um, is where you have people making different choices and coming out of, say, a day centre, those, say, two, three, four people, for, for argument's sake, who choose to take a direct payment, the costs of running that day centre do not reduce by the, the two, three, four um, individual service fund levels. So you have to meet both those costs. You have to give the direct payment to the people who have come out of the service, but you're still having to meet the, the service costs. Um, where that becomes very difficult, councils have to make very difficult choices um, about whether they are going to close um, community-based day centres that, that peop some people still want to use in order to be able to afford to offer the SDS options that, that they're required. And in terms of their role around engaging with communities, I outlined the, the two different views that can be at play there. So all of that needs to be reconciled and all of that will be different from area to area because the configuration of services that we're starting with when we implement SDS are, are different in, in different areas. So I think that's some of what you're, you're hearing coming through from Self-Directed Support Scotland. And there's actually, there's quite a lot going on in there. Um, and I think we've started to talk about some of the bigger whole systems issues today. Um, I realise that we, we don't have um, massive amounts of, of additional time, but in order to, to deal with that, there are some pretty fundamental questions there about how you get the flexible workforce you need, about how you get the investment to the right place, about how you balance what are going to end up competing priorities. There's not enough resource to deliver all the, the initiatives and legislation Paula outlined, so those are inevitably going to compete over a too small um, bit of resource. So a lot going on under that, under that, I think. So when there's a competition, there's always winners and losers. So, you know, who are going to be the losers? 
Well, I mean, I think if, you, if you're asking me what choices local authorities are going to make, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not able to answer on their behalf. I think uh, I'd be reluctant to characterise it as winners and losers. I think I think we 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 do risk perhaps losing sight of the fact that that local government has come a long way on self-directed support. I mean, the, 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 you know, the number of people engaged with it are increasing. The um, self-directed support strategy, which is published, sets out, and again, I'm not going to read out long extracts from it, but I am going to draw attention to the fact that over phases one and two of the self-directed support, it was observed that there's a greater understanding of SDS, there's greater use of local facilities. There's a list, the committee can read it for itself. There are lists under outcome two and outcome three. All <coughs> these lists are based on the evidence we have. The management information that we're seeing, which will form part of what's published uh, in due course, it, it, it shows that uptake is increasing. So I'm not diminishing the difficulties or the pressures that COSLA colleagues are describing, but we are seeing a system that is improving where the workforce is gaining improved understanding and where the public, where, who are really the most important part of all of this, um, although the understanding that they have is not yet as good as we would like it to be, we are improving it. So I think I would want to leave with local government um, the, 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 the matter of the choices that they are legitimately entitled to make. But I don't think we, I wouldn't like to come away from this conversation with the sense that SDS was somehow failing. It's not, it's improving. Okay, can I just sort of finish then, because let's try and end in a positive. Can I just ask Paul Gray, um, what more can the Scottish Government do to work with COSLA and to help local authorities to improve and achieve best practice? We know that some of it exists. How can we get that rolled out a bit quicker? So, I think there are a number, I mean, I've, I've already indicated we, we, we want to wait for the results of the evaluation. And one thing to be clear about, that evaluation is being overseen jointly by ourselves, by COSLA, by um, uh, other local government colleagues, but most importantly by people who represent service users. We want to learn from that. We want to learn from what this committee may say. I think, what can we do? We have, we have resources available through um, uh, our uh, iHub programme, which uh, supports in, in improvement. And that, I think, Ms Lennon, is the point you're making. How can we ensure that where there is good practice, that is uh, uh, spread? I, 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 like, like Jeff Huggins, I hesitate at the word rolled out because, I mean, rolling out what happens in the Black Isle to Falkirk is not, you know, it's, it's, we're, it's never going to work. But there are components of, of, of good practice that, that I think we can continue to support um, everyone involved in this system in developing. Another thing we can do, and in fact, I mean, not in preparation for this committee, but it was helpful as it turned out. Another thing we can do is continue to meet with the, the, um, the representatives of uh, carer organisations and with the people who actually experience the service because I do think there are some quite powerful testimonies and they are not all about what is working. I've already acknowledged the convener's point about, about some who feel quite strongly about what they're not getting from this as well as what they are. I think we can continue to learn. Um, but I think if we adopt a proposition, and I wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be my intention to do this, adopt a proposition that we should somehow move into a mode of telling local government what to do. I don't think that's an effective way um, to run this. Thank you. Just to be clear, that's not what I was uh, recommending. Okay. Bill Berman. Thank you, convener. Can I just ask for clarity? Who is in charge then of this SDS project? Well, local authority or the integration partnerships are in charge of delivering it. Um, I think to suggest that one person was in charge of it would be... Uh, well, I think it would be helpful to know who or who is and, and who can be interpreted how you like. It, it, I, I asked it, it before, I think, in another um, yeah. session about chain of command. Then. I mean, who is at the top of the chain of command then? Well, in, I mean, I think in that context, Mr. Uh, 
Bowman. I'm on top. I'm at the top of the chain of command in 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 the, in, in the sense that the officials in the National Health Service in Scotland. I am the chief executive of the National Health Service in Scotland. I am therefore at the top of the chain of command. This is not something which is delivered by a single agency or body. Therefore, um, I, I mean, I could. Let me be quite frank. Straight. I, I could I could simply say yes, I'm in charge, but it wouldn't be true. Um, I am responsible for, I am the accountable officer for the budget that comes from the areas that I'm responsible for, but there is money which is directly um, ass assigned to local government and therefore each partnership is responsible for the delivery of self-directed support in its area. So does a partnership model work then? Better than almost anything else. That you've tried? Um, there are few things that are not delivered better in partnership. I, I'm, quite, I'm absolutely fundamentally clear about that. I think that it, it is not easy. It would, be, it would be much simpler but much less effective if somebody, and it wouldn't matter too much who along this row of people here, could just give instructions and say this is what's going to happen next and in what order. That would completely ignore, however, the fact that, as Jeff Huggins and uh, Paula McClay and others have explained, these, these systems are delivered in localities which are very different, and a single all-encompassing edict would, would simply not work. There is a ministerial steering group that are jointly chaired by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport and COSLA's lead spokesperson for Health and Social Care, Councillor Peter Johnston. Um, so there is governance in place that oversees integration partnerships, and that is joint governance and deliberately so. Um, I may not be giving you exactly the answer you're looking for, but that, that, that is the answer as it, as it currently is. I, mean, I, I would differentiate between giving instructions and leadership. Yeah. Now, I mean, you've heard from COSLA that they're not happy about everything and suggested, <laughs> for example, that... Um, <laughs> perhaps even more so. Um, that you know, the more money might help, and your response was, well, I will await their submission. Now, I think before I've suggested to you that you have a passive management style where you delegate and let things happen. Uh, could you not be more proactive in, in these matters and show a bit more leadership? Well, I, I don't think any leader will sign up to a proposition they haven't seen. So I, I'm, I'm happy to wait for it and to, to receive it. Um, I also think that... Um, if you have deduced that I have a passive management style, I think you haven't seen it all. Well, I, I wait that. But I, I think being proactive and waiting for something before you act is uh, uh, you know, different, uh, different things. But anyway, I think you've told me what I, I need to know. Can I just pick up on one very small yes, very quickly. picky point? Um, in, you spoke, I think, about, um, I think it was you that actually raised this amount of money that was spent the 40 percent and i noticed that you, you you refer to various funds on uh, page well that's page four to me maybe page two of your submission support in the right direction innovation fund you talk about 2.9 million has been invested 1.2 million has been invested what does invested mean spent spent Could, can we not just say that invested suggests you're creating something for your balance sheet um Mr. Bowman, at the risk of uh, agreeing with you, I agree with you. I, I, it's clumsy drafting. It's not a word I particularly like. I it don't was think it's spent. only you that falls into that. Um, <clears throat> I won't say trap. But, uh... Well, it's, I agree. Okay. Thank Note you. of agreement. I intend to conclude this uh, evidence session. Can I thank the witnesses for coming along this morning um, and providing us with uh, some very interesting evidence. And uh, I now move this committee into private session.